This is part two of reading Greenback Twin Spots in a different scenario than part one. Rather than repeat myself, I would recommend watching part one first so you have some of the background information. In addition, when I contrast the second pair with the first pair, it will make more sense why I think some of the information is pertinent. Because this pair is in its own cage, I can give a better accounting of the live food consumption. I'll spend some time on the pair selection here because the first difference is that I selected these two birds as opposed to them being self-selected. This male was the least forward of the three possible choices and he was attractive to all of the females. This female was the most forward of my remaining female choices. Because she had already sort of rejected the more confident males, I put her in with this guy. And in my mind, I was pairing a, an experienced female with a relatively immature or inexperienced male. I suspect this may have been correct and it may explain some of the things that I saw later on in the breeding cycle. Almost exactly a month after the birds arrived, this pair was moved into their own flight. The flight is about 33 cubic feet in size. Lighting is completely, almost completely artificial. The temperature and humidity are similar to the birds in the aviary. Four days later, I added a possible nest site in the form of a reed ball similar to the kind of nest site that the other pair were using in the aviary. One difference is that I lined the bottom with a coconut fiber mat just to see if that did anything interesting. The female was immediately interested in the site and futzing with the coconut fiber, but the male didn't pick up on that cue. So after about five days, I added a little bit of burlap to the bottom and a little bit more each day um, finally, I took some raffia and wrapped it up the sides a little bit, and after five days, I had progressed in my nest building, and on the fifth day, the male began to supply his own materials and very quickly finished the nest with the female's um, arranging. Everything progressed on an absolutely normal schedule from there. The first egg was laid three days after the nest was sort of complete. Sitting began on the day the third egg was laid, four eggs total. The sitting time was 13 days. Um, the fledge time is 18 days, which is two days longer than the pair in the aviary. The rest of this video, I'm gonna concentrate on the food consumption, particularly the live food as I can isolate that and better account for it with them being the only birds in the flight. Let me start with the food that's available to them at all times. Oyster shell grit, crushed eggshells, and a commercial egg food are in these three dishes. Of them, the uh, oyster shell mineral grit is of high interest to the birds. Not so much the other two. Millet spray and my own egg food mix is also available, as is sprouted seed, either chitted or, or farther along in the sprouting process. It just depends. They also have just a seed mix that I make up, different kinds of millets, um, orchard grass, a couple of miscellaneous seeds. Okay, now on to the live food. In the big dish are mealworms and I use them as a delivery mechanism for other nutrients and to help balance their nutrient profile. So they are always either dusted with calcium powder or a mineral powder or vitamin powder and sometimes cod liver oil because they, are in a, they don't get enough um, direct sunlight in the bird room. Um, in just a second, I'll show quantities consumed as well. But having said all that, by far, the most important food source, it appears, is fruit flies. Wingless fruit flies of the Melanogaster variety. I serve them in water, as you can see. 
It is the preferred food for both the male and female of both pairs. Um, I will also mention that the secondary food for both of my pairs um, is different between the males and females. In this pair, the female's secondary, life, uh, secondary interest is egg food and the male's secondary interest is mealworms. Um, however, <clears throat> that's different than the pair in the aviary and you can review that if, you're of, if it's of interest. One other uh, detail is that the male in this pair does not care for buffalo worms and neither does the female. They would, however, eat the buffalo worm larva. By the time the chicks hatched, the parents were being fed, or the live food was being replenished three times a day, starting first thing in the morning. And at the peak consumption, it was replaced pretty much every hour and a half, um, or about six times a day. put some effort into trying to estimate how much live food is actually being consumed and so I measured and counted fruit flies frozen fruit flies mind you but nevertheless I think you could uh, make an argument about the accuracy of my count of wingless fruit flies but the graph shows that they were um, eating significant numbers of them the baseline live food um, was about 400 fruit flies and a handful of mealworms. The blue graph is estimating the live wingless fruit fly um, consumption. The gray line shows the um, live mealworm consumption as if mealworms had sort of equivalent biomass to um, 30 fruit flies. The two dips in the gray line are representing the mealworms getting bigger, 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 and the, the number is going down, and then I get a new shipment of little mini mealworms, and the number goes way up. So that's smoother than it would appear. In the previous pictures, I was counting one quarter teaspoon of um, fruit flies, and so I can equate the peak consumption of fruit flies back to a measure, and that would be almost four teaspoons. There are four chicks, so it's about a teaspoon full of fruit flies a day. Right about day 13, there was a pretty significant drop in the consumption of mealworms, but you can see the fruit flies stayed pretty flat. And then also, egg food was always available. I didn't try to estimate how much of that they were eating. Maybe to give a rough idea, that would be a teaspoon at each serving three times a day. Both parents fed pretty evenly, I would say, and I would say they tolerated kind of a moderate level of interference um, from me, not terribly flighty, although I will say, if you're not familiar with this species, when they do get spooked, they dive headfirst into the smallest corner they can find, which can get them into trouble, and they're, <clears throat> they've got a really small head that can fit in between these bars like a little gold breast wax bill. The reason they look so chunky is because their feathers are quite a bit longer than a lot of the species, and um, it gives their body a big heavy look, but they're actually quite tiny. Okay, I think that's going to wrap up this breeding report. Hopefully I've covered additional details that might be of interest in combination with part one. Thanks very much for watching. Here are just some clips as the babies are starting to leave the nest and begin to eat on their own for your enjoyment.